Welcome to the Robin Boyd Foundation's Design Matters series. Ivanov left Europe in 1950 and settled in Fremantle, where he established his practice through the 60s and 70s. His combination of modernism and brutalism with an emphasis on ornamentation resulted in a playful combination of textures in the harsh Perth light. Ivan Ivanov's modernist architecture has always captivated photographer Jack Lovell. Having spent his formative years in a family home designed by the Bulgarian-born, German-trained visionary, the architect's aesthetic left a lasting impression. In 2016, determined to document Ivanov's stunning body of work, Jack set out to capture the remaining relics of the architect's career. He recently published Catching Light, with a foreword by architect broadcaster Stuart Harrison and an introduction by son Nikolai Ivanov. Stuart and Jack join us in conversation. This conversation is called Design Matters, Ivan Ivanov, Modernist Architect. Uh, it could also be called Adventures with Ivanov and really will foreground Jack's amazing <coughs> photographs of the work of Ivan Ivanov and also my interactions with this work going back into last century and how we, how we see this work as being relevant today. Um, and I guess the, I think the other thing to say at the outset is Ivan Ivanov is a significant figure in, in Western Australia and, and, and we would argue uh, nationally, <coughs> potentially internationally as well. Jack and I are both ex, you know, Perth boys made good. And, <laughs> but we've been here and all were. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, you know, Robin Boyd and Melbourne and the Foundation do such incredible work. And it's fair to say that that same culture of design appreciation an acknowledgement. It's not quite as developed in Perth as it could be, and I guess one of the things that we see our role here is you know, helping develop Ivanov as a really significant figure um, and helping inform people about the importance of this work. So Jack's going to operate the slides. Jack, yes. do you want to say anything else at the start about who you are and what you do? Yes, um, so as Jamie said, so I, uh, I work as a commercial architectural photographer, sort of specialising in residential and small to mid-scale um, commercial projects. Um, this project has really just been a passion project and one that I started back in 2016. It's been an absolute labour of love, I think. Um, I put in, I guess, countless hours researching the work, uh, getting access to the homes, going back and forth to, you know, with the owners and, 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 and then to sort of photograph them in different light and different season so COVID's definitely you know been a blessing and a curse for all of us I think the best thing to come from COVID for me was the opportunity to spend some extended periods back in Perth which sort of then enabled me to produce this hardcover book. I think it's what we were saying that uh, Jack's a real dual national you know uh, now that West Australia is a separate country um, <laughs> uh, and, I'm a, and I'm a sort of I'm sort of trying to become a dual national, um, and so yeah, I, I, Jack got that side during mm. the when the when the gates came down. When, yeah. the, when the wall came down, yeah. uh, Jack was on the west side of it, and I was on the <laughs> east side of it. And so it, it actually has it created some great opportunities for the for the work. But let's let's go back to your beginnings, Jack. Yes, yeah. So um, yeah, so to kick it off, so I guess my connection to this project and where it all started is the Jordanoff house. So this was my family home. My parents owned this house from 1979 until 1991. This was the home that I was brought to as a baby. Is um, it worth pointing out your mum's here tonight? And uh, Yeah, so yeah, as a side note, my mum, uh, who's a big, big supporter, is here tonight. Um, you probably, she might have been pouring with a heavy hand at the bar so yeah, you can yeah you can you can you can thank her for that too so this is the home that I grew up in um, so obviously I think at the time didn't really realize the significance of the house but I think it um, uh, definitely has played a big impact on sort of I guess where I've ended up and informed I guess my my profession when I've sort of talked to my parents about it particularly my mum I don't actually think at the time when they bought the house they were aware of the significance of Ivanov I guess as a figure in Perth and throughout the course of his career I think his work was fairly underappreciated and he definitely wasn't um, accepted by the wider architectural community um, that sort of I've had multiple discussions with his um, sons and sort of throughout owners and sort of colleagues over time and that seems to be the general consensus that he wasn't sort of accepted so I think it's um, you know it, it's, uh, it's it's amazing this body of work that he uh, that he has built but it's um, 
back to what I was saying, I think um, when my parents bought the house, they weren't really aware of his work or the significance of it. I think they just loved the home. For me, this house holds very special memories. In terms of going back to it after nearly 25 years of not living there, that was quite a sort of surreal moment. I guess uh, what I always sort of recalled about the house was the materials and the detailing. So when I went back to the house, it was quite a surreal experience to step in and sort of see if my sort of memories did add up, my recollections sort of were correct. Particular details such as the sort of sandstone wall that ran through the course of the living room out to the external courtyard, along with the block detailing. Um, these are all original features. For me, it was sort of, um, again, that, that very uh, surreal moment of, um, of stepping back in time almost and sort of going back to your childhood memories and and really it was the sort of what, what started off this project i guess i was i was looking for a personal project um and i spent nearly a year sort of trying to work out if there was a particular architect that i wanted to document or sort of which which path i would go down and when i sort of realized that essentially Ivanov's work as it stood back in 2016 hadn't sort of collectively been photographed or sort of archived to that point and sort of really where it all began. So these photos from 16? Yeah, yeah, so these, these, these photos have been taken through the course of the project. Um, so the house has had several owners. The current owners um, are actually renting it. The, the new owners uh, um, live abroad. Over the course of the last few years, there's been uh, a fair bit of damage, particularly over the, there were some big storms in Perth last year and it's sort of the house got quite damaged and uh, I'm genuinely a bit concerned because it seems like the original owners of the, or the owners that currently um, have the house, they don't seem that intent on sort of upkeeping it and it's in quite a prolific location in Perth. So I think it's worth pointing out this house is one of the earlier Ivanov uh, houses, uh, so it's 1954. Ivanov arrives in Perth in 50 mm. uh, and very quickly starts... Um, Working, um, he's working at a concrete block factory um, that will come in uh, handy later on. Um, <laughs> but he's also working on uh, private jobs very, very, really quickly. And so there's a few houses even that date back to 53, 50, 54. Yeah. Um, and so this is one of the early works. And so uh, we'll probably come back to this point, but th this early work is probably more quintessential post-war modernism. And one of the interesting things about this talk being called um, Ivanov Modernist Architect is Modernism's definition is often, you know, a little bit strictly adhered to, and I think the later work that we'll get to is still modernism. Like this is still how you see um, expression, an artistic expression. It's still modernism. Sometimes actually get a bit too clinical about the definition of modernism, uh, but all of what we'll see tonight, in my view, is is modernism. So, Jack, you, you grew up here and you took these photos, and was this the first one that you shot? Uh, it wasn't the first one. So, it actually, this house particularly took me some time to get access to. Basically, when I started the project, initially I spent the first several months just researching all of the homes and finding out where they were, um, sort of trying to work out who the owners were. Um, obviously, I didn't sort of have any email contacts or phone numbers or anything like that. So, essentially, I put together a letter that I sent and wrote to them explaining that I was an architectural photographer and that I lived in Melbourne and sort of this is my practice, but basically with outlining my intentions. And um, pretty early on, within a sort of a week of sending it, I got uh, several responses and then the doors sort of started to open, yeah. I guess. Um, I dare say if it wasn't for my personal connection to this project and having grown up in the Jordanoff house, I don't think I ever would have been able to achieve what I have. Um, I think it's a pretty tight-knit community and, um, and they are quite private in, sort of, in a lot of ways. And so. they've come out of it. I mean, I yeah. think the Robin Boyd, the homeowners sort of cohort that exists over here has helped as a sort of model for how you begin to talk to each other. And, it's a bit more celebrated. Uh, and there's some pretty active members. Tim, who, Tim Bolt, who's the owner of the Pagan House, um, we'll get to. He's very active in this in this space as well mm. about knowing who the owners are. I think the other thing to say at the outset, in case I forget to say later, is that a lot of these houses are not heritage listed. So one of the things that has been evident for some time is that you know a lot of this work is, un is unprotected. But let's look at some more of the work, Jack. Yes. Yeah. Oh no, some photographs by me. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm older than Jack. Uh, so I, was a, I did my first degree at UWA um, and these photographs were taken in either 1992 or 1994, I can't actually remember. But we studied Ivanoff as part of a subject called West Australian Architectural History, which Duncan Richards uh, ran. I think it was, in, I think it was 94. And um, this was a great subject. It was very, you know, WA focused. And, um, and I, I dare say that if we were doing a subject called Australian Architecture History, like, like I used to run at MIT, we might not have captured Ivanov. Interestingly, I did bring that into that course at MIT. But 
this was a great way of seeing the figures around you that were important. And so Ivanov was part of that subject. And as part of that, we did tours and we went and looked at things and we drove around the Perth suburbs. And uh, this is the Marsala House, uh, which is probably the most famous Ivanov project in some ways. It does enjoy um, state heritage listings, the only house that does. Others have local heritage protection. Um, some of the civic work, the civic work has uh, heritage protection. But so this is me as a, you know, kind of, uh, suburban Perth, northern suburbs kid, going around, and this is blowing my mind in 1994. I'm like 19 or something, and you know I think that I'm in um, Rays of the Lost Ark, and also I'm in, in modernism, like at a, a sort of almost purist, expressionistic level. And so this work blows my mind, and I get inside this house, and these are a couple of the, the sort of um, photos I took with my, I think my Pentax K1000 at the time, um, <laughs> back in the old days of photography, and even then, even with you know me as a sort of um, second year student, you begin to see how Ivanov is playing with light and shadow and sort of feathering this and bringing, bringing this colonnade that comes out and begins to play with light and really works really cleverly with that harsh West Australian sun. Ivanov is Bulgarian, he's European, you know, German trade Bulgarian, comes to Perth. He's not the person you would expect to understand the West Australian sun but he understands the West Australian sun possibly for the first time. And this is what I call a kind of, it takes an outsider to understand something. It's a bit like the Griffins in Australia. You know, you need somebody that, sometimes that perspective from outside to understand something. And I think that slow acceptance of Ivanov is partly due to good old fashioned Australian racism to some extent. <laughs> um, uh, and because Ivanov has had an interesting history and even when I was studying him in the, in the 90s, there still was this sense that, you know, you know, we had a lot of, there was a lot of really good modernists in Perth. There was Cranston Sheldon and there was Geoffrey Summerhays and there were Geoffrey Howlett and all these sort of really good figures. But Ivanov was like, yeah, he got, he, it ran away from him, was mm. the sort of subtext, you know, mm. like, it got all a bit fruity. And, um, you know, no, 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 it, it didn't get, it, no, no, he, he, he understood what you do with a career. Um, Anyway, so this was my early interaction, not as a... I didn't have the fortune of growing up in an Ivanov house, mm -hmm. suburban kid, but all these houses in Perth, are, they're, they're scattered around all over the place, but particularly in suburbs like Dianella, City Beach... Floriot. Floriot. Yeah. Um, they're they like these little hotspots, and you can drive around them. And when, when we do a TV show, um, one of the great pleasures of that was I got to drive around the Perth suburbs again, <laughs> not in my Datsun 120Y, but in a, in a, in a terrible hire car, <laughs> looking at Ivanov houses again. And actually they do come in little precincts and you can see the procurement happening there. You can see like someone going, oh, this is really interesting, I want one of these. Ivanov's early clients were people he met, they were builders. So um, this was Ser were... Yeah, so this house was for Sergio Masala, the builder, yep. um, who actually is still alive. And uh, he came to the first exhibition we had back in 2019. Yep. Um, and I think he was well and truly impressed to see, I think, so many people just appreciating his work, uh, in disco floor and all. Um, Marsala was a builder, Paganin was a tiler. Like the, a lot of these were people were builders. Some of the early ones were people out of the orchestra. Yeah. But well, no. this is a nice photo of that. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this, photo this of is that. a slightly updated photo. So this is actually one of the first homes that I did photograph. Um, so this would have been in the sort of, would have been 2017. When I started the project, I always had this idea of doing a series of sort of large scale elevational shots, which is sort of like you'd see a classic architectural plan. And I, this is 76, yeah. not Marcella. And so I. Um, basically set out to not so much focus on the details initially it was about these sort of these big overall contextual shots and sort of building almost like this sort of uh, suburban horizon of Ivanov so um, in terms of the aesthetic I think that just kind of sort of built after, after sort of starting to photograph uh, the initial projects obviously in Perth like you notice you've got these big blue skies that seem to just be infinite and go on for days you get that sort of that really stark light and depending on the orientation of the homes um, I sort of had to pick the time of year to photograph them so uh, with the Masala house it's sort of best to photograph it where you get that late summer light where it sort of crosses the facade but there's a real sort of starkness and crispness to it that um, I think really sets it apart I dare say that sort of the only other place that I really recall traveling to in the world of somewhere like Portugal over the summer where you get that really stark, intense light. Um, Maybe LA a little bit. Yeah, so I think, but then you get all the pollution as well. <laughs> so it's, um, 
Uh, yeah, I think, like I said, uh, when I started it, it was sort of about these big elevations and the, and the first exhibition I did, I remember when Stuart came in, he sort of walked into the room and he was like, oh, it is this sort of suburban horizon and they're all kind of set in a similar frame. Um, big sort of blue skies, beautifully cut. Manicured grass. Turf lawn. Yeah. Over time and sort of how my approach has evolved as a photographer, I sort of got more and more fascinated by the details. Um, I think it's so key to his work when you look at it, sort of how he got this block work and he sort of, like Stuart said, he sort of staggers it and it protrudes and he sort of plays with the light and he manipulates it and he sort of protects these inhabitants and the homes from the harsh Perth summers, but then in the winter sort of lets that light in and, and sort of internalises it. Essentially, what started out as these big elevations at the, you know, at the sort of the early days of the project, I've ended up now photographing the most minute details, whether they be an interior tile detail or sort of, you know, a small facet. And of that's a, a pandemic block. thing. Mm. That's getting inside because yeah. you could. Yeah, 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 exa exactly. So I think it, um, from a uh, photographic perspective, I can see even over the, you know, five plus years that I've worked on the project that the work has evolved and changed over time. What Ivanov's doing here is he's, he's seeing that external skin obviously as a, as a way of express, being expressive uh, with the block work. But that time in the block work factory, um, this is the years later, he's beginning to understand a really Perth material. Like Perth's actually really good at making bricks and blocks uh, out of Midland. Um, and Ivanov, you know, quickly working out. I mean, that early work he's sort of doing straight modernism to some extent. It's sort of glass and timber, but it's then he begins to, and he starts getting to casting. Anyway, let's look at some more stuff. Mm. This is early stuff again. So this is what, is this Schmidt, Schmidt, Schmidt Lederman? This is the Schmidt Lederman house. Yeah. Yep. This is the house. This is 1958. Yeah. So this is built for the German continent. So this is actually only a few doors down from the Ivanov studio. So there's one particular street in Florida where you get the bank of the four houses. Minor addition that's been added, uh, sort of up in the top mm. left, which was done in, I think, in the late 90s, early thousands. It's actually owned by a fairly well-known Perth architect. Transitioning from the Masala house back to the schmidt Lademan house, you do see there's sort of that earlier, almost like Frank Lloyd Wright sort of esque. It's almost like, it's sort of Marcel Breuer, it's kind of that quintessential kind of 50s modernism to some extent. But what's really interesting about these early houses is you do see him beginning to tinker around with mm. screening. I mean, you know, even this sort of real comfortableness with putting columns on the edge of the cantilever, that's, for me, that's the beginning of someone wanting to put the action onto the edge. So he started to get some glimpses into the inside of the home. So again, it was um, this idea of sort of starting to, what well, first was my approach being the externals and the facades, I guess that I had to sort of build up these relationships with the owners and kind of, I guess, build up their trust and sort of, you know, um, to get access to these homes. Some of them, it, it did take me, you know, two, three, four years. Uh, some of them, you know, I actually wasn't able to get access to at first and then it took homes selling and sort of new owners and younger generations of owners moving in to, to get to them. Um, there was always, you know, there's always a, a couple that I sort of desperately wanted and it's just been sort of by, you know, being patient and then kind of through the course of doing the exhibitions and sort of these talks and I think sort of showing people the work um, that we've kind of built up that, uh, that network and sort of brought these people together. Um, I think where I, I sort of uh, started getting into the interiors that I sort of just became really, really intrigued by the sort of the layering of materials and sort of the juxtaposition and, and mixing of materials that you wouldn't sort of necessarily see where you sort of got the stonework, you've got the jarrah and the timbers and then the steel. I think um, he had an amazing ability to contrast materials and interiors that uh, you wouldn't necessarily think would work together, but mm. somehow when he does layer them up and sort of spatially sort of puts them into his designs, they they did work and it's sort of and it's amazing to see them now 50 60 70 plus years later um still in near original condition um and still you know photographing like this yeah, it's a mastery of materials even laminate uh, will come to i think some of some laminate later but even a, a new material like laminate which is new on the market i've not able to use and, mm -hmm. and, and and in a really interesting way they're really innate understanding but to some extent, it comes from his really exceptionally good training in Munich, but you know it, it's great work. Just a footnote on the the elevational photographs. That was the first body of work that Jack did with these big elevations, and it was what a, what you know when Jack asked me to come and open the sh the first show we had in 2019, it was that discipline about you know this. I'm going to almost do elevations of the of this work, and that was both a um, to do with access, you mm -hmm. know, sort of public, you know, you take a photo. Um, but it was also this kind of almost scientific way of looking at the work and so this, this sort of chronology that you can argue around the work getting more expressive over time, Jack's photos really helped that, you know, because you can see them in this quite disciplined way. 
the recent stuff that Jack did in the show that opened earlier in the year is really around this, this, these internal moments mm, and yeah. just revealing this extra depth. And it gets pretty fruity in some of them too. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a few more um, shots from the Schmidt Lederman house. So actually, again, to be honest, this was probably one of the harder houses to gain access to. Um, Amanda is lovely, the owner, and I've, I've built up a very good uh, friendship with her now. Um, but I reckon it nearly took me the best part of three years to get access to the house. And then to make it even more difficult, there's literally about a month and a half or two months of the year where you can photograph that facade and get the south facing light on it. So uh, I remember when I sort of finally made contact with her, it was nearly another year before I could go back and actually photograph it. So again, this idea of just being, you know, patient and sort of waiting and sort of biding my time, uh, I think really played into it. As a sort of side note to that, once we, once I did sort of connect with her and, and you know, get to um, spark this sort of uh, friendship with her and, and I first did the externals, later on she literally gave me, the, left the key out for me one day and let me just go photograph the interiors by myself. So it was a, definitely an exercise in sort of building that trust and I think once people sort of understood what, um, what I was trying to do and, and obviously with the help of people like Stuart, is really sort of elevate Ivanov's work into the sort of Australian architectural vernacular and, and you know, make him a more prominent figure because I think the work is very deserving. But I think that touches on this issue of houses are hard to deal with, right? They're, they're, people live in them. Mm. Um, I mean, you get you get what I call public houses like this one that, that have come into the sort of wider realm. But there's, there's none of the Ivanov houses are like that. Uh, they're still people live in them. They're, they're family homes often. So it, Jack's done great work in, in terms of getting in them. I've got a technical question, Jack. Yes. What are we shooting with here? So it's all shot on Canon with a mixture of sort of, I guess, mostly tilt shift lenses. I always like the idea of sort of, you know, going in on t as tight as possible on the subject and trying to sort of limit distortion and kind of be as true to the For art. those interior bits, particularly. Oh, for the, inter oh, for the, inter for the yeah, interior bits, yeah. and, and, but actually for the for the facades and the buildings themselves. So on the facades, you'll get way back. I'll get, I'll always get way back, basically as far back as I can actually get. I, again, it's that idea of sort of, I don't like the distortion or trying to sort of over embellish uh, certain features of the house. I like to be as true to the architecture as possible. Well, I think that's what has that elevational quality, right? Exa yeah, exactly. Yeah. In, in terms of sort of the lighting and how I went about it, I think I touched on that before, but again, that starkness that you see in Perth and those sort of big blue skies and, and that real crispness to the light, that is how Ivanov was designed, that's what he was designing for, and that's how his, his sort of, his practice was heavily informed by that. So I think it um, would have been crude to sort of photograph it in any other way. Mm. I think to, to really honest, there, there needs to be like an honesty and an authenticity to the work. And so I guess my approach was, has always sort of been to follow that suit and to sort of, um, you know, showcase it in that light. Again, with the sort of interiors and the details, I, I generally try to leave them pretty sort of much clear of furniture, unless there were pieces that I think particularly fit in um, for sort of context and scale. Um, I mostly sort of took out all the contemporary sort of pieces. I guess that was a, a sort of a personal choice to really emphasise the beautiful detailing uh, in Ivanov's work and also that idea of sort of staying quite true and honest to it and making it about the, the interiors. I'd love to shoot a few more interiors, but I mean, as, as Stuart said, uh, they are sort of houses just owned by sort of very normal people and they don't necessarily have all period fitting furniture. They're sort of not like the homes in Palm Springs that are immaculately detailed and furnished to within an inch of their life. Um, it really is sort of a, quite a mixed bag. So um, in terms of the interiors that I could capture when I did get those opportunities, I had to be very selective about sort of the views and the aspects that I took in um, to sort of build a quite cohesive body of work, I guess. As the project developed and I sort of, you know, started building up more of an archive, there started to be sort of a consistency in the work. And I, and I guess if I shot some houses fully furnished and some that were empty, it sort of that we wouldn't have that consistency. So I think that's been kind of critical to, um, I guess, pulling something like the book together. Um, I wanted that sort of that consistency to, yeah, um, throughout it. So. And I'm, while we're talking, I'm referring to the book, with the, the Catching Light book, which I wrote a little essay in and has all the photographs we're, we're talking about um, here tonight. So we sort of talk a little bit about um, this one house in particular, the Paganin house. This was the house Jamie mentioned that in my run, I was hosted Restoration Australia for, for two years. And this was the first episode that aired, which was season two, episode one. And it was on the reconstruction of the Paganin house. So. Uh, Paganin, as talked about before, was a, uh, primarily a marble um, tiling supplier in, in Perth. And um, his house had been owned by a few people and, and came to the, its current owners, Tim and Lisa, some years ago. And then one night when they were away, the house burnt down pretty substantially. And you get a sense of 
what was left there, which was essentially a slab, party walls, and then the, the sort of uh, semi and underground basement, which was a car park, and the swimming pool at the at the back. And so, it'd be fair to say that this was my favourite episode of the of the, the, the TV show Restoration Australia. In fact, it was the thing that brought me into the TV show. Fremantle Media, acting for the ABC, was still negotiating uh, with the owners of the house on whether that would be. Um, they would get it for the show. I mean, it's a big thing to have someone, you know, film you reconstructing a house or doing any project. And I said, if you get those guys, I'm in. I'll, mm. I'll, I'll do the TV show. Um, and so uh, for me, it was really important. It was a really good opportunity for me also to go back to Perth a lot um, and spend time with my family over there. The building was reconstructed. Uh, it's on the, uh, the boulevard in, in Perth, uh, in Floriot, um, leads down to City Beach, beautiful street. And this is a house with a public presence. So that issue of public houses, this, this is a building that people in Perth know. You know, it's particularly if you live in the northern suburbs. And it's got um, a series of arches across the facade. And it has almost a public building presence to it. Uh, and it's on a very, you know, this street's kind of one of the key streets, from, sort of from the city to the, to the beach. But it's a, you know, it's not a, it's not a crazy busy street. And it overlooks golf course across the road. The clients went on the, you know, the journey of reconstructing it, and um, no heritage existing, as so I alluded to before. So they could have knocked this house down, start again, would have been cheaper. Um, but they did the hard thing. They engaged local architect Tim Wright um, to document the reconstruction of the house, and they're here now. They, they were my um, happy snaps from shooting the house, and these are Jack's beautiful moments of it. And so we followed, as a TV show, we followed that house's reconstruction. It was relatively um, seamless as a, as a project, you know, and there was that classic thing that happens on a good project where everyone's on board. You know, the project is its own agency. So, you know, from the... And this is captured to some extent in the, in the episode. Um, How long was the documentation over? How long did the show take, Steve? Uh, a little, maybe 18 months, uh, 15, 18 months. So, you know, reasonably normal sort of time for a complicated reconstruction, a lot of historical material. And I guess one of the really interesting things about it is uh, Tim, who's the owner, Tim and Lisa, he, Tim's like a remarkable Ivanov buff now. And he was, he was beforehand. He, he actually he, has Ivan's desk in his office. He now yeah. owns <laughs> Ivanov's desk, yeah, and it sits in his house. Um, and he was beforehand, but he became more so. And so there's a certain... Um, forensic energy that he has that the show catches a little bit and uh, I mean he's got lists like Excel lists of all the Ivanov houses in Perth including some that are not well known. So the project to reconstruct this was highly successful you would argue it was a faithful mm -hmm. reconstruction and you know faithful reconstruction of um, buildings you know sometimes it's not that interesting you know but in this case it's a post-war house 1965 in this case, it is really interesting because it exists in living memory. Original owner still alive. People who worked on the house still alive. And so it's a more potent idea, I think. And so it was a, you know, it was a great thing to do. The episode um, was really successful um, and told a story of a, really a family home. And they moved back into the house and they live in it and they love it even more. And, you know, one of the great things about it was seeing how you do a full historical reconstruction in the contemporary world. So, so people have photos, right? They all burnt down with the house. Um, but Tim um, had uploaded all the family photos onto a Dropbox before the fire. And so during the reconstruction, you've got original drawings, Ivanov drawings that are kept at the State Library. They were used, obviously, heavily. Um, but also thousands of photos of um, the family in this house. And that actually gave a whole lot of clues onto particular details that weren't captured in any of the drawings. So some really great detective work, led by really Tim and Tim, the architect and the owner. And as a result, been able to piece together what this house was like and their own, of course, their own memories of the house. Um, and it's just an exceptional outcome. And, you know, it was great. And Jack took a while to get permission to, to shoot it and then um, 
finally has. I don't actually think I knew for a fair while about you working on this show. Obviously, it was very hush hush, and sort of um, you guys were doing this in the background. Um, and so I was the same when I started this project. Uh, for the first sort of two years, I did keep it very much under wraps. I didn't really tell anyone about it. I did keep it under my hat. So when I did find out that Stuart was doing the show, it was probably about the time that I actually came out and sort of told people about the project. So uh, sort of simultaneously, we were both working on these quite um, important facets of Ivan's work and sort of with the same, I guess, idea of kind of bringing it to a wider audience and to try and, you know, showcase it to, to, um, to sort of a larger group of people. Uh, but we're, just, we're both sort of um, unknown to each other's work. Um, with Tim and Lisa, um, I think after the show, as, as Stuart said, the house is very public. Uh, it's on the boulevard and, and um, I think there's, whether you're an architect or fan or not, or mid-century fan, um, I think the general public were actually heartbroken when this mm. house built down. Even it was on the news. Yeah, it was on the news. It was just around Christmas. And even my sister, who I don't think has any architectural sensibilities whatsoever, <laughs> uh, called me nearly in tears saying, did you know that this house had burnt down? So I think it was, um, you know, uh, it speaks to, I think, people like Tim's passion. Um, he actually came to the exhibition that I had back in March. And I dare say probably would have been here tonight if he could. If he could have. But, um, but yeah, I think uh, he... Again, him and Lisa, they put so much time and energy and love into this project, I guess. Uh, it, took, it took me a while to convince them uh, to sort of let me photograph it. Um, it's, uh, this was sort of, I think these photos were taken uh, in 2019. I think it would have been sort of very early summer. Are you standing um, on top of your car? Uh, I'm not actually. I'm standing across the street with a ladder and a, yeah, uh, uh, up very high. Um, Tim was nice enough to pull out his E65 Jag, which he bought because it's the same year of the house as you do. And he's actually recently bought a sort of lime green yellow. It's a cor Corvette, I think, that he mm. uh, that he now wants me to come and photograph in winter at the front. So uh, yeah, it's not nice for some. Uh, <laughs> but interestingly, uh, the car that he had in the garage <clears throat> in the fire was fine. Mm. Oh, okay. I didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know. So the, the whole the fire went right through, and the, and the garage was yeah. was untouched. Because I think we'd had discussions about this, but there were. So can you um, elaborate on some of the sort of just some of the key elements that were left over from the fire? I remember you well, talking that, about some about, about some of the steel the steel work and the sort of how that well, the, how some the of the that had maintained. Well, the brick party walls were okay structurally, uh, and that whole garage and all that. So all that stone there, that's all original. It had to be cleaned up a bit. Some of these plantings were okay, like they had to be trimmed back. But everything above the deck, right, that was gone. Um, and so all the, all the steel, all the structural steel was all melted and, um, or bent out of shape. So all the marble we're seeing here, and this is a big marble house. I mean, Paganum was marble supplier, right? So and in the show, there's some great conversation around the... A trip to um, Italy. A trip to Italy for the, <laughs> for the Nero, uh, um, the stone, um, I forget its name now, but the, the, the black stone that's used on the end of the uh, colonnade and inside very kind of unique Italian stone, you know, trip to Italy to go and source that. Um, but obviously what Ivan is doing here is he's going, well, I'm doing a house for a stone supplier. I'm going to use some stone. Mm. <laughs> but I'm also going to use laminate. Like, this house is full of laminate. Um, and it's old school black edge laminate. For those of us old enough who remember practising, um, you know, you get this little black line and um, in the reconstruction, it was all reconstructed as that. You know, not... Um, and... It was great to see timber, laminate, stone, tile, all used, and, and the wonderful ceiling, right, which was the sort of big thing that connects it all together. The other thing I'll say really quickly about this house, and I sort of made the point, I think, in the, in the show, was the other great thing about reconstructing modernism is it's not like dealing with the 19th century. The, you know, if, you, if this was a 19th century house, you'd have to change it to suit contemporary living, right? you'd have to do all the things people like, like bathrooms indoors um, and kitchens you can use um, uh, and kitchens sort of connected to the living areas and outdoors. This house, there was nothing you needed to change. Like, in fact, Perth housing generally sort of gone backwards. Like, this was, this was still as an appropriate house, like as an architect, practising architect. The moment practising architect, if I came up with a house like this, you know, for a client with great access to light, amenity, view, Ventilation, um, great semi-open plan living, great use of material. Like it's actually this is this perfect. is this is a perfect example hmm. of housing, and that's the point I wanted to make. This is heritage that is not about the antiques crowd. This is heritage that's about answers to housing, how we need to do housing today. Um, even the sort of cleverness of elevating the house so you sort of block out the road and get all the view of the 
golf course. You mm. bowl all the amenities from that. This is the south face, isn't it, Jack? Uh, this is the, uh, you don't know to be more sort of north, I think that's sort of north, northeast, yeah, yeah. And then the pool and stuff's out in the south, south Sorry, yeah, side. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's right. So the north, yes, that's right. So all the lights coming from the north, but that's that's right. And so, and the ceiling rakes backwards. Mm -hmm. and so that north light's penetrating deeply into the plan. It's a, it's, I mean, it's an just indescribably good house. All right. So, on to northern. Out to hmm. northern. So I think it's like so. Um, one of the popular perceptions about Ivanov's work, including one that I had, was that Ivanov mainly designed houses, which is partially true. But a bit like Boyd, did a lot of other stuff as well. This is his work out at Northam, 100 k's east, um, inland. From Over Perth. the foothills. Over the foothills, hmm. into the sort of, you know, the biggest sort of landscape. And he did two buildings out there, uh, the library and the council administration offices for the city of Northam. And they're still there, and they're still in good condition. And they know what they've got. Um, so it's not been, they haven't been stuffed up. The block work's not been painted, which is a big problem with Ivanov work. I'm trying to run four, I think, buildings that have got the original block work left. So the rest yeah, being yeah. residential projects. But yeah, the rest have been painted and changed over time and can't sort of now be pulled back. So to have this in the original condition is amazing. Yeah. And this does enjoy State Hedges listing. The point of make though, Ivanov did a, uh, a heap of commercial fit outs, a heap of shops. He did uh, some commercial buildings, recording studio recently, was up for sale in North Rio. And so I don't know if the houses kind of where the public perception is, but actually it was, it was a general practice. They were doing a lot of work. In terms of big public work, um, this is one of the this really... This is the most significant, most significant project. Thing. Yeah. And, I mean, I don't know if died of cancer in 86. Yeah. Um, and you get the sense that the next 10 years would have been extraordinary. You would think but, so. But, you know, yeah. the next 30 years for Boyd would have been extraordinary. So, you know, it, it is a career cut short to some extent. But this work at Northam, this is where you see the impulses of classicism and modernism and expression beginning to play themselves out. So this is the, um, this is the council chamber. This is the seat of government, right, in, the, in Northam. And it's, it's, again... I mean, look at the density of these columns in this colonnade now. Getting so close together, they're becoming a screen in themselves. Mm. And we've got a shot of the library, Jack. Yes. Again, yeah. these are yeah. Jack's obviously beautiful yep. shots. We can see Just that detail. detail. This is a side detail of the library, right? Of the library, yeah. And here's the overall. And we see we see blade mm. walls being used, again, in screening elements. So, you know, there is a... The modernist... I guess the straightforward modernist um, reception to Perth would be it's modernism, it's Desmond Sands, it's 50s, let's have lots of glass. This is Ivanov going, yeah, you can have lots of glass, but I'm going to wrap the whole thing and screening. And they definitely have a presence in the street, I think. So Northern is a uh, sort of town in the wheat belt, I guess. Um, very much a sort of a you know, farming town. Um, so when you drive down the street, when I did go to photograph these, I remember it was just after Christmas in 2017. So I got up very, very early, got up at about four in the morning and drove out there for the couple of hours to get sunrise. Um, it was, again, one of the projects that were, both these facades were south facing, so you had to photograph mm. it first thing in the morning. And there's literally a gap in a year where you've got about a, five or six weeks where you can get good light on it, and then you've got to wait another year till it comes back. Um, I definitely got a few funny looks when I was standing in a rose bush at Northam, you know, seven, <laughs> six, seven in the morning, photographing these buildings. I don't get the feeling that sort of a lot of the locals tended to understand the buildings. I think I had a few sort of shouts out of the car and bits and pieces. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, look, uh, as Stuart, a TV show. Yeah, as, uh, as Stuart said, I think um, these give you a, 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 an idea as to sort of, I guess, what, what could have been expected if you'd sort of had the opportunity to do these bigger civic, civic projects. Um, you get the block work, you know, the, the detailing again is sort of, you know, if you look back to the previous photo, just mm. so well laid, you get sort of the staggering of the blocks and sort of the way that they catch the light and play with it. Um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's definitely a shame that you didn't get to see more of this in his work. And I, and I think it's, um, again, it's, it's um, just a really unique project that would sort of stand out, you know, in any, any sort of world-class uh, architecture ex exhibition or, um, yeah. And these projects were well drawn, typically. I mean, I remember learning that when I was studying this stuff that um, on some projects, not all of them, but Ivanov would draw the, um, a plan of every brick course, um, which is nuts, right? Like, it's like an entirely insane thing to do. Um, but, you know, where, particularly where you get those modulated um, facades and bricks are coming in and out, you've got to try and capture that and, and document that in some way. Um, but, yeah, the work at Northam is extraordinary. It gets a lot taller. And it really does get into civic building language and what an appropriate, um, what an appropriate civic architecture might be for the 70s. This is 1974. 
Um, so this is getting towards the end of the career. Um, probably peak of the powers, really. I'd say pinnacle, absolute pinnacle of his career. Yeah. And yeah. the houses in this period is too. We'll get to mm. Kessel soon, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, Here we, we go. Yeah. Yep. So this is probably, this might be my favourite house, the Kessel House 1975. I think you said that to me after the first exhibition in Perth. So yeah, well, yeah. favourite photos of Jack. Favorite ha one of my favourite Ivanov houses, 1975, the year I was born. Um, and, and the only one in the sandstone block. And yeah, 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 the only one in the sandstone block. This is yeah. where he moves away from the grey block and goes into that sandstone block that looks, you know, a bit of a nod to the Perth um, limestone. Um, really even ramps up even more that aztec -y quality to some extent. What was it like shooting this one? It's sort of one of the earliest ones I did. So Matthew, Miriam, they've been owners for well over 20 years. And they years. do have good furniture. They have, like, they have great, it. yeah, they do. They, they have beautiful furniture. They have a lot of furniture. Matthew is an avid collector of uh, mid-century chairs, particularly. <laughs> He's got more chairs than I've ever seen, on, more chairs and sofas than I've ever seen in one living room. Um, so I've, uh, I've gone back and photographed this one actually several different times. Um, probably one of my, I'd say, favourite photos from the project w would be this one. This is a photo that I only took about two years ago. I'd gone over there, was leaving their house, end of the day, just gone up to catch up with them on one of my trips to Perth. Uh, I'd often, again, as I said, sort of uh, uh, developed quite good friendships with a number of these uh, homeowners, uh, Matthew and Miriam particularly. But as I was going to my car and leaving at sunset, mm. I happened to sort of see this moment at the entry. So I promptly ran back to the car, grabbed the camera and managed to snap this photo just before the light disappeared. And for as planned and as considered and as um, prepared as I'd been for so many of the other shoots, I find it quite interesting that this is probably one of my favourites. And it was just that sort of that decisive moment or that sort of that split second moment where to me it encapsulated sort of all of these beautiful elements of his work where you get the laying of materials, you get the light, you get that sort of, you get the plant falling in uh, and mm -hmm. the shadow that that creates and that provides that sort of that natural element and that relief to sort of that stark brickwork. Um, Do you have to go back to the photos before, Jack? Yes, I will, I will, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, 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 this house is, this is impeccably detailed. I've, <clears throat> I've been in love with this stair detail for, forever. Just that full riser and acting as a kind of visual indicator and then putting the, 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 the marble behind that, running that into that. Just, for me, I just find that in, incredibly good. But you get the sense of, and all this was drawn, the joinery, the front doors. I'll say something interesting. If you look at the door handles as well, uh, they've been carved as sort of a male and a female uh, door handle, and that was, a that was a feature in them as well. So you sort of get the, the curves and then the straight edges, um, which I thought was quite fascinating. That's something that um, Matthew had pointed out when we were there. And you get a bit of the rotating of blocks here to just really create that elaborate frieze work. It is, it's, it's the work of the frieze. It's, it's, it's classicism in that sense, uh, but in no way is it kind of... Uh, historical in some ways as well. Um, and what the ability we to bring the light in as well, sort of with that perspex, so that's not actually a lit light, that's sort of daylight that's sort of falling in from that mm -hmm. perspex ceiling. Yeah, it's a I mean, that's a corridor to a to, to a the bath To their bathroom, so that's, the, that's, the, that's leading through to the master ensuite from their bedroom. So again, sort of with the amount of stuff that Matthew and Miriam have in the house, you have to be quite selective about how you photograph it. But I've got some of the other details. I think again, one of Laminate. the... Yeah. One of the um, probably also standout images, and I think one that really people seem to love, is the, uh, this bar shot. So all original, I think, when you... It takes a bit to sort of, I guess, uh, digest and to sort of, you know, look at all the detailing, but it's absolutely meticulous, all original, even down to that sort of shag pile carpet, which I can't believe is sort of still in such good condition after, you know, 60, 60 plus years. 60 years of red wine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's definitely seen a few good parties, that house, I think. Um, this uh, detail over on the left is part of a joinery unit um, that sort of houses their you know, amazing collection of um, Scandinavian glassware and other bits and pieces. Um, I guess with my sort of approach, I, I really tried to sort of break it down into certain elements. Um, I could show you, you know, a lot more photos, but in the book, when I've got the bar, I've actually got sort of multiple other details of sort of the upper awning section um, just how perfectly sort of meticulous and cut those details were. Um, and again, just looking at that sort of layering of the materials and sort of how they intersect and interact with one another to create a really sort of warm, inviting space. I think we probably all agree that we'd like to have a drink or two at that bar. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, often when you see an architect designing everything, you, you, you sort of begin to think about this idea, that, you know, the German idea, the Gemeinschaftskunstwerk, of the, you know, the total work of art. And, and some of Ivanov's projects do do that. They are like, yeah, I'm going to design the joinery, the screening, and all of that. Not all of them, but uh, you know, where, where he where he's able to, it just it just keeps going, and the integrity just keeps going.
What else have we got left, Jay? We've got, I think we're getting pretty close to the end. So, yeah. Glen Kessar. Which, what? I'm just going to so this, uh, so this is one of his final houses. Um, so this is in Cottesloe, so it's Set situated. 70s, isn't it? Yeah, uh, 82. Yeah, so one of his very last houses, and also one of the only ones in the original grey block. Not painted. A Not, lot of these yeah. have been painted. Yeah. Um, so this is owned by Juliana Glencasso, who's a very, very lovely Italian woman, and her husband, Peter, was a sculptor. Um, I think he fancied himself as a bit of an architect as well, and builder, uh, a bit of a jack-of-all-trades, really. Um, so he helped Ivan with the build. Uh, from what Juliana told me, I don't think he did the best job. <laughs> and there's uh, elements of the house that... Uh, were forever unfinished. Um, interestingly, it's actually, as it stands, it's now uh, been divided into a duplex, so it's actually two separate dwellings. Uh, basically, there's a dividing wall in between. The dwelling on the right uh, has been given, I'd say, somewhat of a contemporary refurb that is sort of fitting within the um, sort of Ivan's original plan. But again, what I sort of was really interested by uh, with this house were the interior details. I dare say you wouldn't be able to pick what that is on the left, but believe it or not, it's actually a fireplace detail. So that was a collaboration between Peter and Ivan. In the book, I have a, there's a large double page feature of it. And then you see the contextual shot of the fireplace as well. Throughout this house, there are sort of multiple details. With how I wanted to photograph them, I started sort of layering all these abstract images together and sort of just creating almost like little sort of sections of moods of the house. Uh, there, it has sort of sustained, been right on the coast, it has sustained sort of a fair bit of wear and tear over the years. It's literally about 50 metres off the beach on sort of Marine Parade and, and it's a very prominent spot uh, in Perth. With the lighting here, I was, uh, this, this shot was actually only taken on my very last trip to Perth when I was there in November last year, uh, after another lockdown in Melbourne. This is literally just before the sun was setting. As you're on the coast, you've got nothing sort of, I guess, uh, inhibiting the light and you get that really beautiful sort of golden hour. So yeah, I, I, this has probably been a standout house for me. I, I, it took, uh, it took again, it was quite a bit of time uh, to, to be able to get access and I've sort of um, I, I've sort of built up that really sort of strong relationship with Juliana and we'll catch up and we'll have a coffee and sort of I get to see her when I'm in Perth and I think that's been really critical to this project. Um, I, I when I set out uh, to do it originally I just thought I'd sort of it'd be an exhibition in Perth and perhaps one in Melbourne and would see where it go. I never actually set out to do a book um, that, that came about through COVID um, and sort of I guess having the time to keep photographing and to keep developing the body of work. Um, I think probably what's been a, a real standout for me is sort of these friendships and these connections that I've built with these owners and, um, and Stuart and I were talking about it before as well. Uh, I think the sense of community that we've fostered amongst them, there were little sort of enclaves and little individual groups prior to uh, I guess you know, me start doing this project and Stuart with the television show. And um, I think we've both sort of had this common goal of, of trying to bring Ivan's work to a broader audience and to get, you know, to people to understand it and to sort of to recognise it. Um, and sort of along with that, we've, we've built this sort of really strong community of people who are big supporters of it and sort of realise the importance of these homes and how they should be protected. And, you know, once they're gone, that's it. We can't sort of take them back. And there's been some good moves on that front. I mean, I bailed up the minister last year and sort of gave him a quick lecture about um, <laughs> Minister of Heritage um, in, in WA and said, you know, you've got, you've got some world-class, you know, terrible term, but you've got some world-class houses here. Like, you know, you need to, you need to protect them. And it, it, things are moving in the right direction. We go to the next yep. um, sl slide. I want to just, just last, talk... Last little bit. Yeah, we'll just talk very yep. briefly about this um, project that I was involved with last year, it, a whole different way of looking at Ivanov's work. So um, Frame Labs uh, is a Perth-based VR company. Justin's here, one of the owners of Frame Labs, invited me to come on board with the project. They were putting together part of a, um, a project through the West Australian um, State Library called Reflections. And this was called Reflections of Ivanov. And, and the idea here was to reconstruct a lost Ivanov house. And so I came on board and and helped advise on it and ended up becoming a producer of a VR project. Um, and it was an exceptionally interesting and rewarding thing to do. So what we saw before was home beautiful images of the time. This is the Harrison House, no relation, 1954. Again, this is back to the start. This is one of the really early houses. This is, back, this is also 54. And you can see quintessential Breuer modernism to some extent, but you can also see the starts of this playing with light idea the screening um, elements beginning to come into picture. But you can also see these wonderfully colourful, rich 
interiors. And so the VR project, which was really the reconstruction of this house, this house had been demolished in 1990, so a long time ago. But again, a bit like Paganin, still in living memory. Um, and so the project was to reconstruct this as a VR experience. So these are, this is a screenshot from a VR experience with all the sort of original colour of the interior. The, the colour of the 50s interior is obviously to it gets lost over time. And then we had an opening last year at the State Library um, in April last year, which was able to get, get over for. And um, that's when I bailed up Minister Templeman around the, the heritage listing of, of the Ivanov projects. But it was actually incredibly successful. And for someone who was a slight VR uh, sceptic, it was extraordinary um, to get inside a building that you knew through traditional historical means, like historical photos. And this, this project, again, a bit like Tim's house, had great family photos from its original, um, er the whole period of its, of its life, the house. And so we were able to access that from the, um, one of the kids, Jody. Um, she gave us all that material. We were able to, and then help us reconstruct the house. And this moment when I sort of began to sort of walk around this house, it was actually quite an extraordinary way, a new way of looking at this historical work. So for me, the, the Ivanov journey has been both accompanying Jack in his extraordinary photography, but also this idea of reconstruction, both in the Paganin house, a physical reconstruction, and with this house here around a virtual reconstruction. And this was great. Like, we had, you know, the original kids who lived in this house kind of in tears. You know, they were, this, was, this was kind of really trying to make amends for a crime, you know, d demolishing these Ivanov houses. But that continues. So you know, every every couple of years, an Ivanov house is demolished, and it's not a big it's not a big stock. Um, so it's an ongoing project to protect these houses and also use them as a way of um, telling us how to good, do good housing today. I, I think, think that might be the last I mean, slide. Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you.